Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Miller, and this is another Fedora Council video meeting. We try to do most of our business online on uh, mailing lists and tickets and IRC meetings, text-based meetings. Um, but it's also good to now and then do a face-to-face -face kind of video call. I'm sure everybody in coronavirus times is used to, used to this by now, so I won't talk about video calls too much. Um, this month, we've got uh, a kind of a special presentation by a lot of interns who've been working on awesome things in Fedora. And so we've got a lot of people to get through here, so I won't take up a lot of time. I will turn it over to Vipul, who's one of the coordinators for the program, and he's going to introduce that, and we'll go from there. Welcome, everybody. Let's get started. Hey, uh, thank you, Matthew, for the startup and hey uh, i'm Vipul. i work uh, in red hat in cp i work things around fedora ci but today is not about me we have a lot of interns who did great amount of work uh, of, on things around uh, fedora we had outreach interns and gsoc and this council call is to highlight their works so uh, can anyone see my screen i just want confirmation once yeah yes yep yes yeah. awesome so I'm just going to act as an MC and I'll be going through different slides, calling people out and it will be their turn to speak. So I'm, I'm just here to help coordinate this call. So uh, Fedora organizes, uh, we had tea and sometimes more uh, mentored projects where we try to work with uh, different folks who, and try to get into the community, work on a project and it has always worked very good for us. Uh, this year we had GCI, Outreachy, and GSOC, which is Google Code in Google Summer of Code and Outreachy. GCI uh, for GCI it was the last year this time. Google has stopped that thing. But for now we have Google Summer of Code and Outreachy. Uh, let's just jump uh, right into it. I want to call first Murray to give a very brief introduction on Outreachy so that all of us are on the same page about these pr programs. Hi, my name is Marie Norden. I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator, and I coordinate the Outreachy internships. Um, the Outreachy program is, I believe, six or seven years old, and it is a program that expressly invites and creates opportunities for folks who face underrepresentation, systematic bias, or discrimination in the technology industry of their country. So we have a very wide range of different types of projects, everywhere from design to coding projects within Outreachy. And a fun fact, I was an Outreachy intern. That's all I got. Thank you very much, Mary. That was a short and sweet introduction. So that was all about Outreachy, well, in brief. And now we have Sumantru, who is the Google Summer of Code admin, and I would like him to talk about the program for a minute, if possible. So, hey guys, this is Sumantru, and uh, I, I, with Vipul, coordinate the Google yeah. Summer of Code. Um, the program in itself is basically supposed to be for students who want to start learning, or this is a stepping stone for them in open source and programming. So, usually we have a lot of mentors from Fedora come together and propose a bunch of projects. And then we go ahead and pick some of them, and then we try to find interns, and there is a certain application period which goes on. It, it is This program is dedicated towards students, and we have great mentors every year mentor uh, the students. We have org admins like Vipul and me help them facilitate weekly reports and stuff like that. That's mostly what GSOC is. So every year we kind of curate proposals and go ahead. Yes, and uh, thank you, Sumantra, for that. Uh, in the end, if we have some time, we would like to go through some of the questions, if we have around any uh, questions around these mentored projects. But right now, I just want to jump into the main focus of this uh, call, which is introducing our interns and what they've worked on. So here's order of presentation, just so that we know who is coming next. Uh, alphabetically ordered, we'll start with uh, GSOC. And the first project is Dashboard for Packet. Packet is a great project. I'm really excited about this. So Anchit, if you can take the floor and I'll be controlling the slides. Just let me know. Okay then. So hi, I'm Anchit and I'm working on Dashboard for Packet. Uh, my mentors are Hunar and Francis. 
the packet service, uh, Vipul, can you change the slide? The packet service is an installable app for Git forges like GitHub, Badger, or GitLab, and basically you enable it on a repository, and then when you make a pull request on said repository, it validates it, it builds the project in Fedora, and basically it gives you the, uh, you can basically install the copper, uh, you can use DNF enable copper, and then install that, uh, that build project and test it out and maintainers can easily see if it's working and if it is they can basically approve the pull request and merge it so it's easy to test uh, packet service also enables you it helps you to work in source kit instead of this kit so well that's thing uh, Bipul, can you change the slide uh, i have is it not visible there ah okay so progress uh, I built the REST API for backup, and uh, it, uh, I did it using Flask, PostgreSQL, and SQL Alchemy. So the thing here, one new thing I learned here was packet basically, we have different triggers, right? So for, for pull request can be a trigger, uh, a branch push can be a trigger. So basically, packet followed this different, uh, what do you call it, design pattern for databases that I was unfamiliar with and well, Thanks to Hunar and the team, well, I learned it. And basically, it was different, and I learned something new. So that's great. Uh, then I built a dashboard using React and Flask. And uh, Vipul, can you go back? Uh, uh, you, you yes, sorry start. about that. And I made tests for code. So, well, Thomas actually constantly bothered me to make tests for code, and that's something I learned new. So, yeah. I also learned Ansible, and I played with containers and OpenShift. Ripple can change the slide. So this is a picture of the Swagger API documentation since there's nothing else to say. Well, Ripple can change the slide. It's already changed. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't account for the uh, lag in slide changing. This is the next. There's a lag or something. Uh, yeah, I guess. Can so. you open the? Is this the? Slide? Yes, so, yes, the video one. So this is a demo oh, okay. of the dashboard. I see, sorry about that. There we go. Uh, I built this using React and Patternfly. Patternfly, and the Patternfly team is great, basically, because they helped me. I had some issues, and they helped me. Yeah. This is basically the jobs page, where you can see all the list of all the jobs that Packet does. Jobs can be copper bills or Koji bills or even testing farm run where basically tests it, tests your app. It runs your test inside of Fedora in a virtualized environment. And this is the projects page where you can see all the list of projects that have packet service enabled. And you can search it by repository wise or namespace wise and so So you basically, you see the you see you enter the namespace uh, and so example GitHub.com or GitLab.com and you see it, and then you see the list of PRs that have been handled by Packet, the test runs that are running testing farm, the center was testing farm I think, and you can see the releases that have been handled by Packet the branches for branch pushes instead of pull requests and issues packet creation creates issues so well that's yes this is it so my takeaways well i learned the importance of good commit messages because i was constantly bothered by hunor and now I'm going to make good commit messages. I, I and probably proper grammar and no punctuation and basically consistent. So it's important. And then tests. Uh, when I was applying for GSOC, Thomas constantly, like in every single pull request, he pinged me to make tests. And I've learned. And now I do. And now I do make them. 
and I worked with the packet team and they were great, all of them, and I learned a lot. Obviously, good programming practice. So, well, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that. And uh, I don't see any questions in chat, so I guess we'll jump right ahead because I've, I've, I've got a quick one. What, what sure. makes a good commit message? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Basically, it describes what you are doing. Basically, the headline should be uh, sh should describe in uh, one sentence what you did. And one thing Huna told me was to use it so like this. Basically, imperative. Add this feature. Update this. Modify this. Something like that. Instead of instead of something like packet can now do this or packet can now do that. Instead of something like that, you have to make them imperative. And no full stops. I added full stops. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, for the question. And I'm sure a lot of people will learn a lot of things from this slide now. Next, we have improving the network role at Linux systems roles. Uh, and the mentee is Elvira. Why didn't you go ahead and take the okay. presentation? So, hi, I'm Elvira. And my work has been to improve the network role at Linux system role. So, uh, yeah, next slide. So uh, Ansible is an automation tool that helps users configure different target systems at the same time and also deploy software and many other tasks as continuous integration, rolling updates, and many more. Uh, Linux system roles is a collection of roles and modules that assist different uh, system administrators in the configuration of their Linux subsystems. A module here is uh, what we could call in other programs. Oh, <laughs> um, go back, please. Yeah, thank you. So uh, a module here is what we could call in other programs uh, an extension or a plugin. And it's written in any programming language. And a role is a collection of different tasks that the, these users can can get and use, and it usually simplifies their work for many different tasks. In this case, um, in Linux system roles, there are many different roles, like uh, the network role, which is the one I've been working with that helps you uh, creating different network interfaces and editing them. But there's also the postfix one or the firewall one. So there are many different things you can do with, with oh. Linux system roles. Yeah, now next slide. So uh, my main task in the network role is to add PyTest to the integration testing. Right now, they use Ansible playbooks written in YAML, which are the real way that users execute uh, the Linux system roles when they need to. But this is difficult to debug because of the uh, output we get that is the full Ansible output and not just the the errors and it's not very specific. It is still useful and we will still use it because you get how the module interacts with Ansible, but we need a way to, to get in into the particular classes or function to test them. So uh, this is the advantage that has adding PyTest. The fact that you can directly execute the network module from Python and you can get the full power of this programming language and that you can reuse code easily from one test to another. Uh, next. So here uh, you can see on the top part you have the how you write a playbook. It's just a part of it. And on the bottom part, how you write a test with PyTest. On a glance, you can see that, for example, an assert would take you on a playbook more than three lines, while on PyTest, as you can see on line 89, an assert is really intuitive and it's just one line and it's easy to see. Another thing that you can see here is that on PyTest, you can set a, a specific input for the setup of a test. In this case is test NIC1, which means network interface card. Uh, and this will 
ensure that independently of which uh, system you are developing from, you will um, put the same input into the different functions of the module. Uh, next. So uh, my work until now was I've been doing different uh, smaller PRs in order to get in touch with how the network role worked because I didn't have much previous experience with it. So I've been working a bit on, on bugs and also a bit on documentation, but the, the main challenge was the PyTest integration. And as you can see, the, the PR is open. And next slide. So the current progress on this PR is that right now we've been able to execute the module without Ansible, which was uh, the most interesting thing to do because that way you got a uh, read of the unuseful testing, uh, unuseful output. And, and it was quite a challenge because uh, I had to simulate how Ansible modified uh, different uh, file, like different Python modules that, that it needs. So we had to mock them. And the other thing that is the only thing left right now is to make it really compatible with all the supported distributions. Right now it works with CentOS 8, but we need to make it available for the versions that you can see listed from Fedora, CentOS, and Red Hat. So uh, yeah, next slide. So my takeaways uh, that I get from this project is that I've been learning how to use Ansible, which I've never done before, and also to use PyTest. And I'm really liking it, so it's a really cool thing to say. I'm also getting a deeper insight on debugging many system tools. Before this, I was a Linux user, but I've never really take a, a real look about how providers worked with your network information and how they created network interfaces and so, so I, I've really learned a lot from that. I've also started contributing seriously to a free software project which is something that I really wanted to do and that is quite a challenge when you are maybe a bit shy and you just interact with other people through, uh, yeah, digitally. So, so yeah, I really like that too. And also learning to work remotely, which is something that I think it's going to be quite useful from now on. <laughs> and uh, I also think uh, it's a challenge because you get many different distractions and you really need to go through that and really get the work done. So uh, I will answer any question now. What are your, your questions? I'd like to hear. Thanks a uh, lot. Oh yes, definitely. Thank ahead, you. Okay. I'd love to hear a, a tip um, for working remotely. I think even those of us who worked remotely for a long time can learn from people's experiences. So, so you want me to say a tip? Yes. <laughs> That's well. I would like, say, what did you learn? Yeah, I, I learned that I work pretty well at night. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> more than I would think and uh, what's important yeah. is that you you no matter what timetable but you need to get a timetable because otherwise you spend the whole day thinking about all the things you need to do and you are never really working you're never really resting and it can really burn you out easily so so maybe I was like that for two only two or three days and I was already thinking I was going to lose my mind. So it's really important to set timetables for that. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, we all could do better in that. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, let's move to next slide then. Uh, we have package integration with GitLab and the Minty is Shreyas. Uh, yeah, hi, I am Shreyas. I've been working on package service integration with GitLab. Uh, my mentors are Francis and Noor. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, what is package service? So package service validates your pull requests or merge requests 
and builds your project into a better operating system. So whenever you need a pull request or a merge request into a repository, a party service will uh, build your project into a better operating system and uh, make this build status back to the pull request. Uh, Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, I guess this is the lab. I move to next slide. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Party service integration in GitLab. So this is what uh, I've been working on. Uh, the, the, so the first thing that I've been working on was adding Webhook to the project to uh, get the GitLab Webhook and understand the events. Uh, so authenticating the Webhooks in GitLab is way different than GitHub because GitHub has his own way of authenticating the uh, website as the events are coming from GitHub. So I had to work on that manually and how to automate the things for a bit of a different part. So the first thing that we do is pass the events which are coming from GitLab and do things on specific events like the event, if the event is a pull request or a merge request, we know that we have to build that uh, project into a uh, better opening system and uh, send the build status back to the pull request. So, uh, yeah, so GitLab has a different way of sending the build status back because in GitLab you require permissions of the repository to send the status commit. So unlike GitHub, you cannot uh, send a commit status to a GitLab uh, pull request uh, pipeline. So unlike GitHub, where you can send a build status to a commit, I mean commit status to a pull request, in GitLab, you need to have permissions of the repositories from which the pull request is coming from. So there's nothing uh, as external pipeline in a merge request. So this is one way uh, we are sending uh, commit status as a pipeline, external pipeline. And, and, and if a uh, party service doesn't have permissions of the repository, uh, I'm sending the status commit as a comment on that merge request. Oh, so here you can see that the comments are pending, pending, and then these will be auto-updated with the running and the state of the each test or uh, build status. Uh, my take is where research is really important because uh, the first week I've been working on was the project integration with GitLab, which didn't go really well. Uh, there's always a better way of doing it, so plan ahead. Uh, making draft PRs is a really good idea because you can communicate and see if you're going in the right direction or have a better understanding of what you're doing. Uh, well, I've learned a good programming practices in terms of uh, readable code and small changes into the repositories. And by looking into higher stuff of GitLab, we can say that GitLab is not really different in terms of uh, handling of things, but while working on GitLab, I've seen that there are a lot of differences uh, in GitHub or per year. So you really need to plan ahead while working on GitLab or these type of things. Awesome, thank you. Do we have any questions for Shreyas? Someone else that may have a question? Oh, good. Yeah, I have a question here. Um, you mentioned, um, I think, multiple times while you were talking about um, planning and GitLab being different from GitHub really kind of messed with what you were hoping to do. What do you think you would have done differently if you could go back and do this again? Like, what would you have thought about what would you uh, what would you have done to to do this better the second time around uh, 
So while planning, I had a different plan because GitLab has something known as uh, project integrations, uh, which is similar to GitHub app. So I spent a lot of time researching about it and uh, the two weeks I think I spent on it were a waste of time and I think I could gain that more and work on the webhook part more efficiently. So you overestimated or underestimated um, how the differences or difficulties? What, what would you say that that uh, was? The difficulty part was a bit uh, underestimated because I thought I could do it in that time period, but then I realized there are a lot more things that I have to do to integrate it with Packet. All right then. Awesome. Uh, any Thanks other a lot, Neil, for the question. Yeah, no, my my pleasure. Question mark. Um, All right. So moving to the next project, we have NM State. Uh, which is uh, implementing Verlink support for Enum State. Uh, uh, Sudarshan, are you in the call? I just see you left the call. So, okay, we can move ahead and we can come back to this once Sudarshan is back on the call. Is that all right with everyone? Awesome. Jumping through the slides. And now we have, we are in outreach zone. And this is uh, Karma's time to talk about how to create a GraphQL API for Bodhi. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sama. And uh, the name of my project is to create a GraphQL API for Bodhi. I'm Trevor and I'm Could you like? Uh, could you go oh, right. So let me introduce Bodhi and GraphQL. So Bodhi Dora is a great creating system. It's basically an interface for developers to test updates to children um, and for I couldn't. As, uh, yeah, I couldn't yeah, hear I you. I'm having all it? audio trouble. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, I can better. hear you now. Thank you. For sure. Yep. Okay. So, uh, right. So, I was introducing Bodhi. It's Fedora's update gating system, and it's an interface for developers to suggest update changes and for testers to test those uh, changes. And a GraphQL API is basically an HTTP-based API which can be used to query and post data. So right now it helps us to get data out of Bodhi. And uh, this is actually the first time a GraphQL API is being used. In so um, a GraphQL API ha uh, has a typical graph-like structure which is composed of nodes, edges, and fields. A node is like an individual object, like a release, and an edge is a connection between two different objects, for example, all releases in an update. And a field is an attribute of an object, uh, like the ID prefix of a release. Um, could you go to the next? So uh, why GraphQL? Uh, currently, we have a REST API for Bodhi, but it was not following the best practices. And vis-a-vis -vis its counterparts, GraphQL, is, uh, GraphQL exposes a single endpoint, and it allows for a faster deployment speed, and it also enables declarative data fetching, and therefore we get flexible output structure. Uh, the next slide. So uh, a more interesting way to realize GraphQL's uniqueness would be through the analogy. And um, say you want to order, order a pizza. So with REST, you can only choose from three pizzas on a menu. And if you want something custom, you would have to manually combine their toppings. But with GraphQL, you can order any custom pizza. 
and you get exactly what you asked for. So if you want mozzarella cheese, you'll get that. And if you want mushrooms or something else as a topping, you'll get that. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so about the timeline and my progress. Um, as part of the final application, we had to give a timeline and uh, my mentors and I came up with uh, the timeline as shown on the Gantt chart. So currently we've added the GraphQL endpoint and we're using the graph graphical client for querying data. And we've also added graphene and other dependencies. We've added three queries as of now, uh, all releases, get releases and get updates. The first one fetches all releases and the last two fetch specific releases and specific updates based on the arguments which we send to the query, which is used. Um, and we have added tests for each of the aforementioned uh, queries. And currently we are extending the implementation to other objects like users and builds. And um, we're also looking at pagination. And um, currently we are just getting data out of Bodhi. Uh, in the future, we also want to uh, write data onto Bodhi or allow users to write data onto Bodhi. And for that, a stretch goal uh, for the project is to add authentication and authorization, which we will work on. Could you change the slide? Uh, this is a working demonstration of uh, the GraphQL API. So could you please start that? So we're using the GraphQL API. And we will use curl to send a post request uh, to the slash GraphQL endpoint. For example, we want to query all releases and we want their names and um, their state. So this is the structure of the query. And this is the post request uh, we're using curl to write that. Um, this is the output that we're getting, but if we want a nicer output, then we can also use a client like HTTP pi. Um, so if you want to query like a specific release, uh, we can do that as well. This is the query and the argument is F33. And this is the output. We get a similar output on the graphical client. So say we want to query the long name as well. Uh, we'll give in a win. So uh, we got an error message which gave us a nice hint about the name or about the correct attribute. So let's do that. So that is the long name and the state of the update. Thanks. Uh, so my key takeaways, uh, one of the major key takeaway has been a considerable growth in coding knowledge and capabilities, and also confidence in the work I deliver. And much of the credit goes to my mentors. And I also learned about uh, the importance of good interpersonal skills and communication abilities. And I had a great community experience and it was a one of a kind first hand experience in the industry. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Thanks a lot, Karma. It was a great presentation. Do we have any questions? I don't think so. That's, that's good. Let's move ahead.
Uh, next, we have Fedora Bazes migrating to Bazer and Snehal. Take this part. Hi, I'm Snehal, and uh, I've uh, been working on migration to Badger. So, uh, yeah, my mentors are Michael and Cyan, and let's yeah, let's get right into the. Uh, so, this is how uh, Fedora Badges uh, looks uh, right now. Uh, you can see that there's uh, uh, there's a message, a Fedora Fed message hub, uh, which collects all the messages from every event that is happening. And uh, Fed badges uh, is uh, the heart and soul of Fedora badges, which uh, reads these messages and uh, applies some rules on them and checks whether someone uh, is earning a badge and awards it to them. Similarly, we have cron uh, services, which uh, for some uh, uh, third party, uh, uh, so some uh, applications, uh, some uh, messages which don't come on Fed message, we need uh, cron services. And of course, you can also uh, award badges uh, to scripts that sysadmins can run on the server. And uh, yeah, so the uh, plan for migration is pretty simple. Uh, just replace everything that has the rear on it and uh, move it to uh, Badger. So uh, here, the rear API would be replaced with Badger client. And uh, yeah, uh, the Postgres DB would be Badger's uh, MySQL DB. Can you go to the next slide? So uh, yeah, this, uh, the things that I've already done for Badger uh, have been uh, the uh, the first thing that I did was make a uh, SDK. Uh, we call this Badger client, and this is basically a Python interface to call the REST API of Badger. Pretty uh, uh, yeah, it's a class-based API, which I'll talk about uh, after this slide. Then of course I learned about uh, unit tests and. Uh, yeah, this is the first time I uh, wrote tests. So uh, it was pretty nice to actually learn that. And then uh, we also, uh, I also wrote scripts to add issue and revoke badges. So this is admins, if they prefer to use scripts, they can still use them. Uh, then uh, up, uh, I built, uh, S2 I built the images uh, for a badger server, which was probably the uh, task which was the toughest. Uh, probably explains why I've written it down twice. And uh, yeah, so uh, I had to try like a bunch of different base images uh, for this to work, but uh, in the end it was working. And uh, then I also made OpenShift templates and uh, uh, added uh, Fedora authentication. So there are two major tasks that are pending right now, which is migration to, uh, uh, migration of uh, Fed badges to Fedora messaging and uh, its integration to uh, Badger client. And then there's also the migration of data, uh, which, so yeah, I have to migrate the Postgres data into the MySQL data. Can you go to the next slide? So uh, this is the Badger client, and uh, you can take a look at the uh, uh, API that it provides. It's pretty simple. It's a class-based API. I've tried to uh, type check it, so you can, if you are using any code editor, you can, you'll get all the, uh, uh, all the types that are, that are required by these uh, APIs along with that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So yeah, my takeaway, uh, yeah, well, some people call it takeaway, uh, I'd call it things I didn't do. Uh, so yeah, so working from home was uh, a different kind of experience. I'm not really used to it. Most of the time I worked from my bedroom and which was a big no-no because working from uh, the bedroom means you're most likely gonna fall asleep. It's better if you have a different room and then uh, yeah, work there. So you have that mindset just as soon as you get inside that room. Uh, communication is key, of course, uh, be in touch with the mentors always. Uh, usually I'd uh, have uh, weekly meetings and that's uh, the only point I communicate with them. Sometimes I, uh, uh, contact them uh, between weeks as well. But yeah, that's uh, one thing that I lacked. And DOTS, which uh, stands for don't overthink stuff. And I think it's uh, uh, most of the time, whenever I was uh, trying to carry out some task, uh, I would overthink it. And uh, end of the day, I realized that the, the solution to my problem was the first instinct uh, that I had and overthinking just made me lose time. So yeah, thank you. Uh, 
uh, and if anyone has any questions, I can answer them. I've got a question. How many badges do you have personally, and what what is your favorite <laughs> one? <laughs> I think my favorite one is Baby Badger. <laughs> But yeah, I don't have a lot of badges. I think I have some 10. I yeah. haven't been that keen on collecting them, but yeah, once Badger is online, I'll be trying to grab them all. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Awesome. So, uh, uh, good presentation, Sunil. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you briefly mentioned in your presentation that part of this was involving moving the database from Postgres to MySQL. What, the, what did I hear that right? Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that yeah. Was, yeah. Okay, because like that, I just didn't expect to hear that. I was just trying to make sure <laughs> I didn't hear that wrong. <laughs> yeah, Badger is using MySQL. That's a yeah, little that, unfortunate. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't usually see people moving the other way, but let's move ahead for now. <laughs> sure. Uh, great. So. Next, we have Smira, who will talk about creating and improving designs for different Fedora project initiatives and events. So, Smira, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Smira. Uh, my mentor is Marie Norton, uh, and I was uh, my project is uh, creating and improving designs for Fedora's initiatives and events. Um, so the project, uh, basically, I'm a part of the design team, and the design team provides artworks, user experience services, usability and general design services to the Fedora project. Um, so there are a lot of new initiatives that are that are always in motion in Fedora. And so you need design stuff for them. So I, um, I, my task was to work on them. Next slide. Yeah. OK, so this is the first project that I worked on. Uh, so we needed a, a template for the budget reports. Currently, the Fedora budget website requires you to manually enter data um, because the script doesn't always work. So uh, the, the idea behind the project was to uh, make a template so that anyone can easily enter the data and it looks consistent, easy to analyze, and looks pretty too. Um, next slide. So the process was my first, the first thing I always uh, had to do was research, which was very important uh, in any design project. Um, so research meant uh, evaluating what my uh, project deliverable was, um, how others did it. So if, if, I was, if, if I was making the budget report, how do others make a budget report? What does it look like? What is the current trend? How does it look? So that was my first, uh, the first step that I would do. The next one was to make a couple of templates. Um, can you go back? Next step is to make a couple of and see what works or doesn't. Look up stuff from each template and then narrow it down and then iterate over and over till you reach a final uh, deliverable course. Next slide. Uh, Final design that we uh, decided. Um, even after the final project is done, after we submitted, a lot of people uh, give input and they have questions. So after we can go to the final design. Next one. Okay, so uh, this, the next project I worked on was for graphics. Uh, so to highlight the components of different functions, elements of the work done to make sure that people understand what other teams are doing and to encourage their contributions. Uh, that was the idea behind this project. Next slide. Okay, so um, again, uh, and the, it started with uh, research. So I had to look up how infographics look, um, what other things I have to take care of. Even technically, infographics are supposed to have big, bold text, colorful, more, more graphics, things like that. Uh, the next step was drafting templates. Uh, so these were the two templates that I worked on. And uh, the third step was soliciting information. Um, so if I, you guys must have seen my mails and messages and tickets and comments that I left. 
So, and the fourth part was the bigger research, which was actually understanding all this information that I got, because then I had to kind of um, work on it to improve, uh, to represent the information. And just, I had to understand it myself so that I could make graphics, make designs, make artwork for that information. So that was, uh, that took up a huge uh, chunk of the task, uh, understanding what, what each and every team does, um, what, what are their motivations, uh, what are their goals, um, what the current projects they have going on, and what, what exactly is the project. Because if I didn't know myself, I could never accurately depict them in the infographic. So that, the left uh, one, uh, this you see the design, that is actually the final um, template that we ended up using. And this is the final one for Fedora Join. So um, next slide. This is the project that I'm currently working on. So this is the Fedora zine. Um, the motivation behind this is to recognize people who are making Fedora awesome, gain more contributors, highlight products, and uh, zine will also be used to, dis it will also be distributed at conferences, hopefully soon when we have more physical conferences. And of course, a digital copy will also be available. Next slide. So of course, again, uh, research. I had to look up how zines were. So a zine was a concept I was not familiar with. What exactly is the aesthetic of a zine? Why are they like? How are they different from a magazine? It's not just a. It's not just a smaller mini magazine. Uh, it's a, it's a, a publication in its, it, itself. Right, so I had to look up and actually understand what zines are. Uh, the next step was designing covers. So these two that you see, these are actually like the final ones and we'll be using one of them for the cover. The other one in, will be somewhere in the zine itself. And the third part is soliciting content, which is currently going on. Uh, next slide. So uh, for the third part, I need your help. I want everyone to contribute to the zine. You can submit anything you want. It can be paintings, it can be poetry, recipes, photography, anything that you want to submit. Um, it, it would be good to have in the zine. And that is the ticket link for the zine if you want, if you're interested in making a contribution. Next slide. Okay, so these are the things that I learned. Stop doubting your work. So uh, honestly, this is because of Marie and the Fedora community, who's always always nervous about my designs and the the, the stuff that I've worked on. I would always think, oh, this does not look that good, or this is not really like wow. But uh, I, Marie always encouraged my designs, and she would always I. It's not just her, uh, even after I would submit my work, everyone from the Fedora community would appreciate it and the love that put in uh, built my confidence up and uh, kind of helped me be more comfortable with showing my work in public. Uh, the second is research is very important, uh, especially in design. You have to make sure that you understand the content of the product and the product itself, the target audience, why are you making what you're making. Otherwise, the final design will lack a vision or if you don't put, up, put enough research in your, in your work, then the user will not be able to understand it and it won't make sense to the user. And the last one is to step back from time to time. So there were some periods where I would just in like for one week, I would just keep working and working. And the thing is that did not really, more work did not equate to um, more like better, better work or better designs because sometimes I would lose vision or track of what I was supposed to be doing. So this is what Marie would always suggest me to take a step back, uh, eval see, like evaluate again what I'm supposed to be doing, take a breather and then go at it again. And that would help a lot. Even in programming, I guess this is called rubber duck programming, I think. So when you are, you, when you are stuck on a problem, you just look away and um, it comes to you, the solution comes to you. So that actually helps a lot in design too. So yeah, uh, thanks for, um, anyone has any questions? Uh, I don't have any questions, but uh, I want to say thank you for the beautiful artwork. The join uh, 
poster stood out to me in particular. The other, um, you may have seen it in my Nest keynote. So yeah. uh, thank you yeah. for that. I probably should have put the credit there by it. Uh, so I apologize for not including the credit. Credit yeah, is cool. important in open source. So thank you very much for making that and all the other things you're working on as well. Thank you. This designs are great, Smira. I'm sorry for pronouncing your name incorrectly earlier. Uh, no, I <laughs> Yeah, so I don't think we have any questions. So let's move to the next slides then. Next, we have porting and redesigning Fedora websites. And Meher, why don't you start now? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Meher, and uh, my, uh, I've been working on porting and redesigning the Fedora websites. And my mentor is uh, Rick Elrod. Yeah, we can move on. Good. Okay, so I know most of you must be aware that currently the Fedora websites are being maintained in two different repositories. The subdomains like alt.fedoraproject.org, spins, labs, arms, those are maintained, being maintained in, a, in the Fedora websites repository and they are independent sites as of now. And the main website, which is getfedora.org, is, uh, is in the new repository. So my job was mostly uh, basically to move all of those independent websites to bring them under getfedora.org and uh, rewriting them in the new framework, which is the which is Flask and Frozen Flask. Okay, so uh, yeah, so basically I had to um, uh, integrate the current build script uh, to include all of those websites and. Um, uh, all of those download pages have, have several download links and um, the checks and stuff. So for that, we're using a YAML file. And um, uh, so it's a one point destination for anyone. Uh, if anyone wants to update the download links, uh, like for instance, if we want to include display the beta edition or if some link is broken and we don't want that to appear or if uh, I want to override a certain download link. So I don't have to know the entire code base, but I can just uh, make the changes in the YAML file uh, uh, and it will automatically reflect in the uh, download links there. And uh, for the rest of the, the routing part, it's uh, these are just static HTML pages. So we just have to tell Frozen Flask where to find them. So, uh, uh, and um, for the checksum download, uh, we uh, the cur current um, websites that the current subdomains have um, most of them have a different uh, page for the checksum downloads, and um, uh, some of them are directly linking the checksums along with the download. So we're planning to move all of those checksums to a uh, to the security page, and so that um, you know anyone who wants to find any of the checksums can go over there and uh, can uh, it would be easier. So yeah, that's also something I'm working on. Um, yeah, we can move forward. Uh, yeah, so uh, the major part of this project was redesigning all of those pages. Um, uh, so I tried to, um, uh, you know, make, uh, the, the, these websites are the first point of contact for anyone who is not that familiar with Fedora for the downloads. And so I try to make it as uh, user friendly and easy to navigate as possible. And uh, I try to make sure that the user finds what they're looking for and um, not, they are supposed to be minimalistic and concise and yet they should be containing all the inf important information about the download and the support resources required to use them. So, and all the websites should be consistent um, and pretty. Yeah, we can move on. Uh, these are just some examples. If people, you can just skim through these. I'll just go around. Uh, this is the IoT page. Um, these are spins and labs. Uh, uh, this is alt cloud. Uh, yeah, the next. This is an example of the KD Plasma desktop uh, for spins. Uh, yeah. So I uh, I started working around um, like I started in early July or something and this is my first ever open source experience so it was a bit intimidating in the beginning uh, you know understanding the whole code base and trying to make sense of how things work and especially uh, establishing a Git workflow to uh, you know have it all work together so yeah it was a bit overwhelming in the beginning but my mentor Rick really helped me. 
uh, at every step and um, now that I'm comfortable, I um, am having a lot of fun. Yeah. So yeah, so my some of my takeaways are that when you are uh, building something for the user, you have to look at things from their perspective. Uh, you have to understand uh, like how they perceive and what they want. So you have to make sure that you consider all of that and not just see your own perspective. And another thing is that you can never get something right in the first try itself. You have to uh, keep reiterating and take inputs from other people, consider their opinions. And uh, sometimes you can run out of ideas or things to do. And um, so yeah, you should always keep looking for inspiration. And one of the most important things was uh, writing clean code. So um, I try to keep in mind that um, I'm not the only one who's going to be reading this code. There are people after, there will be people after me who are going to work on this code. So I try to make it um, as easy to understand and readable as possible. So yeah, that's it from my side. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mehar. Do do we have any questions around this? Yeah, I have a question. Um, where yeah. can we see your work in progress, or maybe to another point, when when do you expect this to start being merged into the production website? Yeah, uh, most of my webs uh, I have um, the, they are all locally built, but um, I'm just waiting for Rick to finish the um, the AMI script for the alt, and then I can send, start sending out PRs. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I have a small question just for my confirmation. Fedora Easy Fix was not part of your work, right? Uh, no, no, that wasn't. Awesome. Okay. That was just something just going in chat. Thanks a lot for clarifying that. So uh, Sudarshan is back. I'll go back to the slides. We don't have anything anymore. So I'll try to go back. And Sudarshan, uh, you will be next. Let yeah. me just see if I can find the slides on time. <clears throat> I'm really sorry for the mind. There was a network issue. No, it happens. Hopefully, I can reach there before all of us are asleep. Okay, I think I found it. Yeah, it's yeah. There you go. Hi. You introduce yourself now. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Arunagiri Nadan Sudarshan, and I'm a third year computer science undergrad, and I, I'm really. In Excited. I was excited to work on this project because this was my first open source project. Uh, but I have, uh, and a person, uh, as a student who is interested in networking, it was very exciting. And uh, next, and next uh, slides, please. Yeah. Uh, I was working on uh, NM state, and the project you know, aim was to uh, enable NM state to be used by other programming languages and system that doesn't support Python. NM state is a Python library that manages networking states of hosts and uh, using a defined schema. And uh, the project we used was Warlink. And Warlink is a simple protocol that uh, encodes all the messages in a JSON format and communicates through uh, Unix and so uh, TCP socket connections. And Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so far, yeah, I have completed the uh, support, implementing the support for Warlink, uh, Warlink support in NNN step lab. Now the basic all functions can be accessed by Warlink. And uh, still this implementation uh, pending for re uh, in a review stage. Uh, it's all, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's all being, uh, um, Amended a uh, slowly bit, a uh, bit of small changes from the uh, members of the group, and uh, we have also, I have also uh, <clears throat> implemented the systemd services as NM state warlink. And during this process, it was we were able to identify some issues in Python warlink package that didn't support what we expected or as documented, and we were. I uh, had uh, some discussions to uh, review or change the version, and uh, we understand that it, we should support the uh, package it's been shipped to most def in default. So we uh, we have been working around that to manage those issues. Next slide. <clears throat> yeah. So this is a 
a sample screenshot I have posted how to how Valink works with the command line tool. And uh, the first line it shows that uh, we can uh, use uh, call the Valink uh, in state function show in the spe specified way using mentioning the Valink address it's been listening to, or we can use the resolve either currently the Valink is only being. Uh, we encourage the users to use only this uh, unique socket uh, file uh, based addresses because of the, some um, uh, because of some access control that should be addressed later. And uh, the second line shows that uh, there's some uh, we can use the directly the uh, using the Valink interface and the uh, show you, where when we use. Um, a Valink utility call resolver to resolve it system wide, and it, we no need to specify the uh, address each time. And uh, the uh, second line shows how to pass an argument, or uh, in this case, the state of the state we desire uh, in using Valink uh, command line tool. And actually, Valink doesn't accept JSON, but it uh, just accepts only the JSON string, right? <clears throat> Yeah, and Valink can be. We can also access this using Valink clients. And uh, interesting thing is, uh, we can the Valink clients can we can build the clients using uh, any programming languages just with the support of JSON uh, and uh, Unix sockets. So the, this is a just a small example using Python client. Right. And the left, uh, the, the screenshot left, shows uh, that the screenshot shows the that NM, uh, NM, NM state uh, Valinx uh, uh, interface uh, definitions. And interface as you can see, every method see and errors uh, returns a log, which is a debug or higher level. So the user can debug it. And uh, one of the uh, things we had to work around is uh, passing the arguments through to Valink and uh, in the current one of the issue was that and we had to uh, because of that we cannot directly pass the arguments and we we can only pass it without any issue using a J, yeah, JSON uh, or a JSON object and uh, we are passing currently the in instead Valink accepts the parameters in a Valink object under the arguments uh, key and uh, yeah, I hope it will be addressed in later Valink packages. And these are some outputs how Valink show command and error formats that been that's currently in use. Yeah, and my takeaway is as being a new a new experience. I uh, really enjoyed working with the community. I had a I was uh, shy to come in because I thought that uh, contributing to open source had a uh, need to have a greater understanding in code and uh, pra uh, good practices. But uh, these days I'm learning a new language. And while learning, I am contributing for the back uh, open source. And it uh, really changed my idea on open source. And working with professionals, thank you. I should mention my mentors, they were very helpful. And uh, Fernando helped me really in uh, completing and uh, uh, giving me uh, feedbacks to improve my commit messages and testings and uh, other mentors too. And it, this has been a challenging experience. And I uh, hope to continue uh, contributing for open source. Thank you, everyone. Any Amazing. Questions? Do we have any questions for Sudarshan? I don't think so. Let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, now I can see everyone's faces. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, <coughs> thanks a lot uh, to all the interns. You did a great job in explaining all the projects uh, you have worked on. Uh, I guess, and we are very much on time, I guess, in my opinion. And if you have yeah. any more questions around Minted project, now we can talk about that, unless someone else has to discuss something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I have a general general uh, question. Um, people talked about enjoying the experience. I'm glad we were able to provide that for you in Fedora. Um, 
what could we have done to make it easier to be part of the Fedora project? And what can we do to make it so that when your internship is done, um, you you know, even if you go on to a job somewhere else or whatever else you're doing, we can make it so you uh, would like to stay involved with Fedora as you continue in your, your career and life. I think that was a question for interns, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the current system is great. It's OK. So well, it's great. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the thing about uh, uh, the thing you said about uh, contributing even after the internship, I think I'm going to contrib keep contributing just because it's a challenging task to uh, contribute here. And yeah, it's help me grow and yeah that's the, one of the reasons why i keep contributing i like yeah, I working with other people this is the first time i've basically i've worked on open source projects before but not as in with other people like i i have to interact with the team every day and we discuss things sometimes they don't know the answers either so we do research together and stuff like that this Basically, working as part of a team, that's what was the, what, what I liked most. Yeah, the community here is really amazing. I think I came here to, for the project, but I'm going to stay because of the people. Oh, let's write that one down. That's, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Um, if I, I did put you on the spot with that question there, but if anybody wants to tell me later, like if there's things we can improve to make your experience better or uh, to make, especially uh, going forward or as an intern, like um, that DM, you can find me. Let, let me know. Thank you. In my case, I just want to say thank you to all of you because the work you are doing is pretty awesome. Uh, I think all the projects are going pretty well, and thanks to people to 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 organize to everything related to the internships. And you are very welcome. You can reach any of us, not only Matthew, but uh, anyone in the council or even in any of the teams. Uh, you can. You already should know where to find us on IRC or Matrix or, or whatever. So please reach us if you have any questions or if you want to contribute further. Or just hang out in the community, you know, just hang out, talk to people. That's even very appreciated. We love I, you all having here. I, I know people have already said these things, but we mean it. We just don't say it because we want to say it. <laughs> What are you I have something? another thought. I, I would just wanted to say thank you to the mentors, um, the folks yes. who have taken their time to mentor the the new <laughs> fresh blood. <laughs> um, no, but really, thank you to the mentors for putting in the time. I mentored this this round. It was my first time, and I I found it to be fun, fulfilling. There was a lot of of good times. So hopefully. Um, People have, uh, have enjoyed the mentoring experience as well. If anyone wants to comment on that, if there's, I'm sure there's more mentors on the call. Yeah, hello, I'm Nicole. <laughs> yep. Do you have a comment or just hello? Sorry? Did you have a comment or was it just to say hello? No, just to say hello. I'm Miguel. <laughs> hello. Hi. <laughs> Glad um, to have you here. <laughs> all right, then. Uh, thank you again, everybody, mentors, mentees, um, support people, all of everything. Um, it's uh, great to see this. It's one of the many things that makes me excited about the future of Fedora and open source. So uh, nice to, nice to hear from you all. Thank you again. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.